I will start, so Vladan will join us. And um, uh, welcome to the today's session uh, that we are starting. Uh, and it will be until 2 o'clock, as it is scheduled. Uh, during the session, we will have two presentations. But afterwards, we will open for discussion proposals with you, as well as with uh, the uh, participants. And um, uh, so today we have, on my left side, we have Antonia Lampi, we have on the sound Iliana Fokianaki, uh, here is uh, Corina Apostol and Vladan Jeremic, and um, uh, even uh, Vastave, the curator of this conference, has uh, been inviting them for a reason because they, as uh, 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 collaborators, have been forming two uh, different platforms, our projects, and one is uh, Future Climates and the other one is Art Leaks. And actually, we will have an opportunity to hear more about these uh, initiatives here by today. <laughs> I'm t intending to say tonight because it's very dark. <laughs> So, however, um, uh, through these examples, actually, we will find um, uh, different uh, proposals. Uh, we can uh, learn about different proposals, how they work, and uh, open up uh, questions how we can organize, unionize uh, transnationally, and how, in a different context, uh, labor rights have been. Uh, uh, work with or how in these uh, particular perspectives uh, have been addressed. Uh, so, uh, Antonia Lampi is a curator, she's a colleague of Ivana from De Appel, and also she is now, she's Italian, but working for uh, the past years in Berlin, and she is a co-director, artistic co-director in Savvy Contemporary. Uh, uh, Corina is, um, okay, Iliana, <laughs> okay, is Iliana, Iliana, who is on the sound, and we can hear her voice. It's uh, actually a curator, theorist, and educator based in Athens and Rotterdam. She couldn't come, that's why we will have the presentation by Antonia and uh, combined with the voice or with the opinions by uh, Iliana. Uh, Corina is uh, coming from Romania, but from the Black Sea, and she's a curator. She had this uh, brilliant uh, lecture yesterday, and uh, today she will talk with the, uh, and she's now based in Tallinn yes. as a curator, and she will talk with Vladan, as I said, about the art leaks, and Vladan is our old comrade, I would say, from Belgrade, that is an activist and an artist, uh, and uh, yes, that would be shortly. Uh, so I would like uh, to ask you to start. <laughs> So I wouldn't take more time. Uh, oh, something about me. Okay, I'm uh, Biljana Tanurovska, uh, Jolavkovski. Uh, uh, I can describe myself with many names, but okay, I can say I'm a um, cultural worker. I work as a curator in performing arts. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Lokomotiva. Nomad Dance Academy, which is a regional platform, also with Lokomotiva, co-founder of uh, Association Yadro, but also co-founder of this place that it's, I would say, one of the first places for contemporary performing arts and culture in Macedonia. So that's it, briefly. So, please. Uh, thank you so much for the introductions, and to Ivana and Philip, um, for inviting me. It's actually really a pleasure to be in Skopje finally for the first time. And um, to add to Iliana Fokianaki's presentation, she founded a few years ago a space in Athens called State of Concept. And the reason why she's not here is because yesterday, for the very first time, um, the Ministry of Culture of Athens decided to encounter um, representatives of the independent scene to consider, let's say, their financial future. Hence, 
uh, let's say, the future climate of her own institution is heavily determined by this encounter. So that's why, that's why she's here virtually uh, via uh, yeah, sound recorded messages. Um, I thought to start um, with a kind of maybe biographical introduction um, in relationship to the founding of future climates, but also maybe also simply why we decided to perhaps think more directly and literally about labor rights um, and um, how they relate to art workers and not just to, let's say, thematics or content engaged with on stage, uh, if we think about the exhibition as a stage. What opened, the crack that opened in this moment is that suddenly, um, you know, um, you lose a job in a matter of months, um, you're pregnant and you become a parent. Um, and it, it is really in that moment that I suddenly had to face the reality of uh, what it means to essentially be working without any kind of right and any kind of also, um, I, I, I think even thinking process uh, about future scenarios, future scenarios in which the, the present might you know, change radically. And, um, and I think that it is really um, in this moment that uh, the facing of how incredibly, um, uh, not just precarious, but I would say even actually structurally unjust, very often the cultural context is and the art context can be, and how little we even bother to consider what type of rights and labor rights we actually are part of, and what type of even practices we actually legitimize, legitimize or are implicated in when, with, uh, uh, when, when not even um, expecting those to be in place. Um, and I'll cut here now and instead let uh, Iliana speak. Maybe if you can put the second image and then, yeah. Um, speaking about it, of course, is a starting point for discussion. Very often, especially when we think about parenthood, by the way, in the art world, it's just a topic that goes kind of like undiscussed. Um, and it's extremely difficult, very often, and I want to say this, I'm very often still now, you know, invited to things saying, oh, we are a child-friendly context, of course you can come with your child, for example, which technically means that you have to afford all the costs yourselves, that are actually zero provided uh, for parents. And so it's really interesting how completely there is a huge gap between you know the notions of care of solidarity etc that are sort of presented within the realms of you know whatever exhibitions public programs etc versus the ways in which the infrastructure and when i talk about infrastructure i don't talk about buildings i talk about actually people social textures and relationships that are um, sort of enacted um, whatever in the art context um, are yeah, completely idiosyncratic, essentially, and extremely conservative, um, and uh, extremely patriarchal, actually, in its functions. Like, as a woman, very often, um, or as a parent, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna put it only to women, but let's say the type of perfect art laborer and art worker is somebody who essentially has no roots, no family, is mobile, um, it, and is mobile enough to actually move any time, is available on weekends, uh, in the evenings, and potentially does not ask for any type of space um, that uh, sort of relates to uh, relations that are outside of the sort of um, whatever work, working market. Anyway, we'll go back to that. Um, and so this is, I think that it, it is basically in this moment that I met Ileana Fokianaki. So in this moment of crisis, after um, a, a, a strong and profound changing experience both in Cairo preceded by Italy and in a moment for me of transition in which I became a parent and I, somehow this state of crisis led me to, um, to, I would say, really a new and different way of entering the labor uh, market, I would say almost, of, of the art context. I'll give now the um, sort of voice to, to Iliana if you can play the first sound file. Hello from me as well, and uh, thank you, Antonio, very much for the introduction. I think it's uh, wise to actually begin by explaining a little bit the situation in um, uh, in Athens uh, prior to the founding of uh, Future Climates that happened with me and Antonio together. 
So um, the situation in the art world, the ecology of the art world, of course, was extremely based if not solely based to DIY and exchange economies, as it is the case for many peripheries, in fact, um, of the European continent and beyond. Um, but um, the specific, let's say, idiosyncrasy of Greece was that we have a large amount of um, ship magnets that own collections um, and are very much active in the international field of the art world, be it being in uh, boards of museums like the Guggenheim or the New Museum or Tate Modern, etc., etc. Um, so basically, when a state of concept, in fact, actually uh, was founded in 2013, what we had in the Athenian landscape of arts was these big foundations, like the Deste Foundation that belongs to a collector, Dakis Ioannou, that was collaborating with big non-contemporary art museums, like the Cycladic Museum or the Benaki Museum, that are mostly museums that are dealing with um, uh, ancient artifacts or, let's say, um, Byzantine artifacts. Um, but they were giving space to these collections to um, exhibit arts, artists, uh, and let's say artists that have, uh, you know, climbed quite high up into the stratosphere of the international art work. Therefore, we're talking about names like Sarah Lucas or Louise Bourgeois, etc. So we had that from one hand, and then we had commercial galleries. And here I would like, to, of course, to, uh, to put a little asterisk of who are the people that are, are opening these galleries. It's very much class-oriented. Uh, it's, it's, it's middle, upper class, and upper class people that of course, make um, you know the conditions for these institutions through their own uh, budgets and through their own affluence, and not necessarily uh, make healthy businesses in the sense of uh, making profit or actually having checks and balances in terms of what comes in and what comes out. So you had this, and also you had a state that was literally non-existent, uh, extremely corrupt, as it's in most of the cases in the Balkans where particular artists were benefiting with very rare uh, public commissions for sculptures or what have you. One big case is when they built actually the metro of Athens where you had a lot of artworks being uh, specifically site specifically created for, for uh, and commissioned for that. And then, uh, of course, not anything like, uh, let's say, an art fund or an arts council or something like the Mondrian fund, nothing like that. And then the other thing that you had was all the uh, actual cultural workers that were working mostly for free. So the conditions um, that were created by the uh, private institutions and the galleries were those that uh, we could say that were not extremely professionalized. E.g., uh, you didn't have um, contracts or consignment notes in terms of what came in and what came out of a gallery, what you gave to a gallery, what you consigned for them to sell, etc. They never paid for production. Uh, they um, did not pay you on time, although they might have been paid for the artwork. Many times they lost artworks or they declared that they have lost artworks, whereas in fact they were actually selling the artwork and keeping the money for themselves. And a lot of these types of situations, uh, this is very much <coughs> happening until today. So this is how the ecology works. And then when you had independent curators, freelance workers, most of the time they were paid extremely low salaries when it comes to curating an exhibition in a museum or in a contemporary art center or a commercial gallery. <coughs> and if they did actually uh, do uh, exhibitions, DIY pop-up shows in uh, spaces uh, just for short periods of time, the whole project was literally done with zero budget. I'm sure that none of these things are actually unfamiliar to you. Okay. Um, so I'll give uh, maybe a, a short introduction to actually what Ileana was particularly interested in, in of my work before that, which is, so this was Beirut, which was a space that was founded in uh, 2000, 
uh, end of 2011, actually in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings. And something that I will be focused on is, I mean, or one of the few things I want to highlight is that it was a moment in which a lot of money was pumped into the country from different international foundations um, to support whatever, new democratic uh, forces and essentially to support independent organizations of all sorts. And of course, the pumping in of money in the country had a huge effect into how many organizations suddenly could actually exist, while, however, creating a very strange type of dependency because very often organizations were depending almost 80% from one single fund, um, which is, again, nothing particularly uncommon. I mean, in Egypt, let's say differently than in Greece, there is no big private patron or private funder that uh, would uh, in any way support the arts. And so actually the whole independent art scene is uh, exclusively dependent on international funding coming into the country. Um, on the other hand, there is an extremely difficult legal situation because the state does not want NGOs or not-for-profits to actually exist at all. It's not that they care about culture, but they do care about human rights organizations and advocacy support groups, etc. And all these independent organizations do fall under the same legal registration which means that actually a lot of institutions like us um, actually uh, had to register as private companies. In fact, limited liability companies or um, legal firms in order to depend from another ministry. However, again, the very complicated thing is receiving foreign funding, which basically um, had to happen by founding not-for-profits abroad in other countries because most funders cannot transfer money um, to an organization that is legally registered as a for-profit, you know, such as Ford Foundation, for example, it is an extremely, or was an extremely important funder in the, in the region, which basically means that a lot of institutions had to open up offshore um, basically fictional organizations uh, abroad, uh, for example, for very different sort of almost biographical reasons, like you have a contact somewhere and of course you need to open in a country that has a legal framework that actually allows you to exist in a place and perform work somewhere else. So, um, for example, in the art world, most organizations were actually uh, registered as not-for-profits in Sweden. The film industry, very often in Belgium or in the UK, theater, particularly in Belgium, etc. Um, can you go to the next slide? Anyway, um, in uh, here you can actually just go on. Um, basically, in 2014. Um, after the military coup happened, suddenly, um, you know, founders in general didn't find Egypt as particularly uh, seductive anymore, you know. And also, you know, when I moved there, et cetera, like it was really a moment where the whole international art world was also extremely seduced and attracted by the Egyptian situation. So artists, et cetera, were invited, curators from all over the world were coming all the time. You know, we literally had emails like, you know, could you organize a studio visit possibly with a veiled woman dealing with the Mubarak regime in one way or the other? Like this was really the kind of market and language. And 2014 was this moment where the attention and the spotlight on the country simply moved uh, out. And of course, this, this had a huge impact, again, because a lot of money suddenly disappeared. Um, hence, a lot of things that you know, were building on like future imaginations were actually had to completely rethink themselves and uh, were kind of left with nothing. So this is uh, the space. It was an, an old villa from, from the 40s. Um, so while, of course, in reality, the country was in one of the most vulnerable situations ever, hence where the independent scene would have been particularly important to continue to exist, um, and in which suddenly also all these people were in an extremely complex legal loophole as well. So again, what they needed actually was precisely um, support precisely then, which is exactly in, instead what, you know, lacked completely. Um, so what we um, decided to do as the sort of closing chapter also of, of, of Beirut, which, which had to close by then, was something called the Imaginary School Program, which was basically 
um, you can move on and maybe you see a little bit of the students. Um, it was basically an eight month kind of educational program, discursive program, um, uh, program of gathering, um, which was basically based on trying to um, sort of hold on to the knowledge that had been produced uh, in the country in the, uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the last few years, particularly focusing on how economic, um, let's say, uh, trajectories shape and determine also what you can do and how you can do it. This is based on another consideration, which is also the fact that in order to get certain types of funding, you have to, obviously, as is always the case, um, uh, sort of, how do you say, perform certain things that the funders imagine you should be performing, right? And when most of the funding comes from abroad, it essentially means that you have organizations somewhere else in the world imagining what might be relevant in the country in that particular time, which in the case of Egypt was, of course, social engaged practices, practices that were dealing somehow politically with the situation, which instead, a, a whole lot of artists were completely refusing, saying, what we're doing with the political situation is our activist work. That does not mean that this needs to be responding on a kind of like one-on-one -on -one relation with what our artistic practice is about. You know, we are in the square just like every other citizen, and citizens in the square are not dividing themselves into working categories. We're all here together as citizens fighting, uh, you know, the current government. And um, hence, it, it was really, it became really this dilemma because on the one hand, the whole scene knew that in order to get access to funding, you needed precisely to do that type, those types of work. So essentially that had a huge impact, you know, on what the scene actually was, let alone the fact that also everybody knew that in order to make it to international shows, this is exactly what an artist from Egypt was supposed to be performing in that particular at time. You cannot not talk about your Egyptian revolution and it's on this premise that you're actually even invited to, to be in that exhibition. So it becomes almost uh, an, an act of like actually uh, uh, sort of like cutting freedom of speech. Like you did not have the possibility to speak about anything else, right? Um, and so this is actually what the program was trying to see. On the one hand, what kind of impact particular types of funding lines had on the scene. On the other hand, also of course, how how um, sort of institutions uh, were run, you know, what type of creative ways, which included, for example, the legal registration, this is very often knowledge that you cannot know, that is also should not be written, because if the government understands how, you know, many not-for-profits work, um, well, that, that would be detrimental, because a lot of things would not be possible anymore. So it was trying to hold on to a type of knowledge that is very usually attached to practice, that you kind of encounter just by doing, and is not something that can be written, but that we felt was very important to pass on to a younger generation that hopefully will continue a struggle that instead, let's say, our generation was kind of uh, f phasing out from. Um, and um, of course, also again, trying to understand the type of different spaces and um, let's call them acts of resistance, even though I'm, uh, yeah, I don't know, I'm always... Um, find difficult the word, uh, they can be enacted also to resist certain international pressures, not just local ones. Um, and, and, and this is something that Iliana was actually particularly interested in and found quite interesting links with Athens at the time in the moment in which Documenta was arriving. So also where all in a sudden, you know, and, and that was also Athens in the post, you know, big deal between Germany and, and Athens and the post uh, Varoufakis sort of political um, battle, and hence, all in a sudden, also Greece became interesting for the, for, for the international art world, and the question was how to try to, um, uh, let's say, think how to deal with, a, with an extreme interest that you know already is going to be also very short. So it's a kind of extremely fast also consumption and how to sort of, let's say, capitalize on it by trying to reverse it in a kind of long-term potential engagement. Um, yeah, so I think Iliana is going to speak again. So these are just images uh, from, 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 from the Imaginary School program where before. So basically, to continue, um, when in fact, I mean, State of Concept opened with a kind of a dual um, set of goals. One was the educational one. We provided free uh, tutorials and meetings um, to artists and art students. 
Uh, that was one of the core things that we started doing already by May 2013, although we did not have yet a physical space. And the second one was uh, exhibitional. So the initial set out was four exhibitions every year, uh, exhibitions of artists that have never exhibited in Greece, mostly solo exhibitions, uh, and one group exhibition inviting an international curator to actually give the opportunity to <clears throat> local artists. Uh, I, I will remind you that it was pre-Documenta era, so there was no interest whatsoever in uh, contemporary art in Greece or let's say very limited one. Um, and we thought that it would make sense to actually invite an international curator, give them carte blanche, they can do an exhibition that they want, but we have one clause and that is that they need to include at least one artist that is Greek in the exhibition or that is based in Greece. And that worked really well. So we had that in 2015 with Tom Morton. We had that in 2016 with Nick Eikens from the Van Abbe Museum. And in 2017, I had uh, invited Antonia Lampi following the work of Beirut Beirut and uh, seeing actually um, the situation uh, in Cairo, of course, but also uh, the way that the institution was reflecting in Cairo was quite impressive. And I liked the last project that Antonia had done, uh, which was a three-month school, in fact. One of the reasons that I invited Antonia for that was that it would take the place of an exhibition, let's say, but not really, because we already knew that in 2017 we were having a Documenta come to Athens, and there was already an influx of internationals coming to do small pop-up shows or uh, you know, uh, short-term galleries or whatever have you. Uh, therefore, I knew, I, kinda, I was kind of already uh, preemptively thinking that there will be an oversaturation of exhibitions in Athens during that period. And I thought it, that State of Concept would want to actually stand out from that and offer a, a, a different reading and not necessarily through the exhibitional format. So Antonia came uh, for research already um, a year before and we were started to discuss in 2016. And through this discussion, really, what happened was that we started through the frustrations, through the gridlocks, through the uh, feelings of injustice that we felt from the art world as very precarious art workers, both of us, that there was something that was needed to be done. It was a little bit very much Don Quixote-like, that, okay, you know, we should, we should focus on something that is more concrete and really reflects on the problematics of our practices. And that is actually how, uh, in fact, Future Climates was born. Uh, and then we had, of course, the first uh, chapter of it. Um, and for us, it was also interesting to start from Athens because of all these uh, details that I, I explained in my previous uh, segment, but also be because, of course, symbolically, it was extremely interesting to see a very huge mega exhibition with a very big budget coming to Athens vis-a-vis -vis the extreme conditions, the extreme labor conditions under which most of uh, the art workers were operating. And it was interesting for us also to reflect on that and see how that would actually affect the populace of the, you know, the micro world of the, of, of the art scene, but also to see whether there would be any shifts in the way that institutions operated. Now, from the time that actually State of Concept was founded in 2013, it kind of ignited even before uh, the announcement of Documenta coming, uh, a set of new institutions, uh, whether they were artist-run spaces or curator-run spaces that opened uh, in the years that followed until uh, we met with Antonia. So we had, let's say, a kind of a richer subject matter. We already had about nine institutions, some of them you know, not working full-time, some of them working part-time, some of them studios that were kind of becoming exhibition spaces. Most of them artist run, um, and it was a it was I think, and I think Antonia will agree with me. It was a very good case to start from. Uh, of course, we we thought that uh, we would have, uh, let's say, some particular um, or special or um, you know. Um, unique uh, ways uh, of instituting and of practicing, of, of curating and of artistic practice that we would find um, through the, the labor uh, spectrum. 
but we very clearly, very soon, we realized that uh, this situation is one that is shared globally uh, in not only what we thought was the periphery, the financial periphery, and I'm using the term periphery here uh, through you know, uh, world economic theory, not necessarily geographically. So, yes, we thought that that would be only for uh, peripheries, but then we realized that it includes semi-peripheries and it includes literally anything that is not the center and actually, in fact, in many cases, the center, the financial center as well, um, be it uh, Berlin, be it London, be it um, Paris or New York. <coughs> So that was more or less, let's say, what prompted um, this uh, encounter that really flourished um, and became future climates. Um, okay, if you can go to the next uh, slide. Sorry. Yeah, so the first chapter of what we did was called the School of Redistribution. And basically what we were looking at was really like how... And, and it was, I mean, it, it consisted of a series of new commissions to artists, um, public programs, and particularly uh, a three-month um, sort of research program uh, for researchers from well, different parts of the world, but I would say they were more or less all Europeans, with 50% uh, of Greeks and 50% of international people. And the idea was really to try to focus on researching and really getting sort of both quantitative and qualitative analysis of how small-scale organizations work and function, what the economy behind it, what the funding structures, what even, I would say, the sort of um, careers are of many people working in small organizations, and of course, also monitor the ways in which large organizations instead function, and what type of relationships actually exist between, between them, between organizations of different scale. And and especially what the relation is, not just in terms of who's hired at what point of his or her career, but also what type of benefits very often uh, large organizations actually have from the work of small ones. So um, what kind of echoes almost uh, end up uh, falling into, in, into larger museums um, work. So can you move on? Well, anyway, this, these are some of the, this, this is a piece by Navin Khandosos, who was really focusing also, again, because this was, again, really an important starting point, which is funding and economics. Like, that was really our starting point. How do we work and what is actually possible based on where the money is coming from? You know, what are funders exactly asking? What is, what is expected? What outcomes are expected? And when, at what point? Um, and this was a this is a this this was a wall painting really playing with the type of graphs that usually um, are behind the scenes, but actually are a very important shapers of what can be done with which artists. I mean, think of the most simple thing, which is that certain artists out there in the world have massive national funding, which means that you know uh, working with them will be funded. You know, I think the Dutch and the Mondrian is the most classic. Why are they so distributed? Because you know that if you want to work with a Dutch artist, you're going to get a lot of money for it. And I mean, this is not something we can uh, pretend uh, to ignore. And um, that has a huge impact in the distribution of their work. Hence also what type of voices are heard when. Same for me is equally problematic with the whole sort of uh, route of, you know, residency programs. Again, in Cairo, I mean, it was full of like Germans, Dutch, whatever, Swedish, Danish, etc. Because they get money to come. Of course, in terms that money is also used for the life of local organizations. That's, that's to be said. It's a trade that's happening out there. Um, but the truth is that then it is a particular type of artistic practice, of language, of worldview that ends up also influencing different local scenes. And I think that is something else that we were really looking into, including, for example, what type of artists and when do come to Athens and do new commissions and also work and distribute artworks that are about Athens, you know, out there in the world. Um, can you move on? This was a new commission to uh, artist Alexandra Pirici, um, who 
worked um, on basically the Parthenon marbles and the huge case and issue of repatriation between the um, Acropolis Museum in Athens and the British Museum in London, like really, really trying to look back into the, you can move on, into the, this is, this is, this is the, <laughs> some of the sculptures we're talking about, uh, move on. Yeah, um, so it was really a, um, it, it was a basically performed piece uh, around 40 minutes where the performers were also constantly speaking and it was a very almost dry lecture uh, that they were performing while uh, enacting and embodying the different types of stories that run through the Parthenon marbles. And it was really looking into how, you know, they were acquired, the, the controversy around their acquisitions, ending up really in looking into the financial aspects, again, that are behind the fact that, for example, most of the, um, let's say, uh, the, the landmarks of the British Museum are actually all stolen, looted objects from other parts of the world, you know, from the Benin marbles to this Rosetta stone from Egypt, etc. And so it was really looking into also the claims of the British Museum that calls itself a universal institution, a universal institution in which all of these things should be there precisely because they don't have any geographical borders. And then in the work, she was matching that into looking into, for example, who actually has a visa and under what premises to even enter to London and go see these things. And then even looking really at the revenue, like how much money does the British Museum actually make with the ownership of these works? Um, also basing it on all reports about visitors, you know, and, and that's the thing. Most visitors go to the British Museum to look at artworks that were actually I mean, not produced in, in, in Britain, and in most cases actually just acquired illegally. Um, to ending up to even imagining some sort of a financial speculation as to what it could mean to at least create some sort of performative repatriation by which even in the sculptures are not there, what if an ongoing performance would be enacted through the British Museum by which also a certain amount of money calculated upon the revenue that the British Museum makes would go back to Athens. The history of the piece is also more complex. I mean, the idea is also that every time it will be performed, it will have to deal with either Greek diaspora or you know, uh, performers from Greece, that part of its revenue also goes back to the actual um, producers, et cetera. So also tries to engage, let's say, with the, with the whole economy around, um, around or let's say, that, that forms the backbone and, uh, of the piece itself. Um, you can move on. Yeah, that's uh, so. We had yeah, we had a lot of public programs inviting different people. Also, particularly you know people engaged in like rethinking how you know institutions are supposed to be functioning. Also from older generations like I don't know Maria Lind, etc., to engage in new discussions as to how things function today and what type of relations could be um, could be newly established. And this was something for me. Maria Lind was quite interesting because the whole idea of creating new transnational alliances, for example, between institutions of different scales really was inspired by a text that she wrote that I was telling to you yesterday about where she talks about museums and small institutions as the whale and, uh, and the plankton or, you know, the muscle and the brain. Maybe she actually mentions the muscle and the brain and the whale and the plankton is something I put in. I'm not sure anymore. But the idea that small organizations very often, I mean, if we think about an audience that is very often definitely not huge, mostly of professional, of peers, but they do the experimentation, the brainy experimentation that very often large museums cannot do. And then it's that sort of groundwork that then passes on and once it's kind of like already established or legitimized in one way or the other, at least from a category of peers, then moves on to large institutions that sort of pick up, you know, certain, certain artists, um, make them mainstream, um, et cetera, et cetera, so that in a way the, 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 the first perhaps um, larger, um, like there, there is a certain dependency also of large institutions from smaller ones. So the question is, can they take any responsibility over their life, you know, like how, I don't want to say just direct economic responsibility, but even in lobbying. Like, how can we think about lobbying only between organizations of different scale? We need to think about different positions of power, of security, of negotiating power. And if we understand ourselves as existing as an ecosystem in which we all relate to each other and are codependent and co-constitute the, the, the field, then we cannot not think about some sort of responsibility and accountability even, I would say, for the life of of, of different organizations. Um, so that's pretty much what we were sort of inquiring. Well, here you say, you see this is also a set of concept. You can just scroll on. 
these are some of the participants, and uh, let's say each participant also had some sort of research slash thesis where they were looking into new, technically really new models in which, for example, small organizations could exist, which were not j purely based on, you know, being 100% dependent from either subsidies or a completely volunteer work, free labor. Hence also that, you know, there's very often this connection, oh, small organization, a very young professional that keeps this job until, I don't know, you don't have a child or decide that you need a job in which you just, whatever, make more money and like move on. And this is what we find, you know, structurally problematic because small organizations are not just about being young or not, um, not needing certain types of rights yet, um, but about doing a type of work that is fundamental for the field. Um, I'll move on because we're, yeah, this is still the students. I, I will give the, the voice to Ileana again. So the second chapter of Future Climates occurred under the auspices of an invitation that I received from Cadiz Foundation um, that was working with um, the European, let's say, region, and they were looking into exhibitions with institutions, not necessarily uh, through a, uh, let's say, mono curatorial vision. So I received a, a, an invitation from Cadiz Foundation in Paris to um, actually contour an exhibition or a position for an exhibition that really sums up uh, the first four years of uh, future climates. Uh, that was in 2017. And therefore, of course, because future climates was a very recent and quite important chapter of our um, exhibitional um, and other uh, practices, um, we had the second chapter of future climates um, at the end of 2017 in December in uh, Paris. And what we wanted to do was to actually invite institutions to have a really long session where we were discussing uh, primarily, let's say, pinpointing the problematics and secondly, discussing um, formats and ways of actually dealing with these problematics. And of course, there, uh, it, there was a great shock because we uh, initially, when we were in discussion with CADIST, we were thinking, oh, you know, we are in Paris, therefore it will be very difficult to actually find extremely precarious uh, institutions or collectives um, or other forms of, um, you know, collective practice or platforms. But we realized there are many of them, some of them also, in fact, living in squats or occupying uh, spaces. And they had the exact same problems that we were having in Athens. And this is linked to what I said priorly, that we were thinking, of course, that this was only related to the economics and to the, you know, the financial side of things or the way that power is distributed or knowledge is distributed in terms of geopolitical um, concerns. But then we realized that, of course, even in the centers of power, you have the exact same, um, uh, let's say, aftermath if you're not part, if you're not the one clog in this big machine that is very much institutionalized in terms of the state and has state funding and is very much into, you know, funding rounds and funding applications and has, you know, again, is very professionalized. Um, and there we had presentations that were coming from uh, several uh, different um, places and locations in Athens, uh, sorry, in Paris, and uh, presentations from Victoria Ivanova that uh, I'm sure that Antonia mentioned before, the excellent work that she did with Alexandra Pirici, and Wage as well, that really framed uh, let's say, possible scenarios and solutions of what it would be uh, if we were uh, to consider uh, to create some, let's say, informal uh, contracts or informal uh, set of rules through which uh, we could uh, operate uh, in a European um, terrain. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to be quick now because I feel it's getting too long and maybe some things we can just uh, discuss also directly, but I think that what we kind of um, 
I mean, there, there's a number of things that maybe I'm just going to read out, actually, which are, let's say, different ideas that I feel we've been sort of discussing or speculating about. Um, and of course, this is this actually comes from another show that I curator, but I think that this idea of sense of belonging, that embracing more conditions is very important. Like, how do we remember that we need to become new political subjects, like I was saying yesterday, and that every action that we do as individuals will have consequences for a whole lot of a broader category. Like, every time we, we decide to do a job for free, we're actually having consequences on our colleagues and the whole um, um, and the whole field, actually, because we do legitimize by that practices. Um, and I think that maybe understanding that we are implicated and that every action, and that's what I meant also yesterday, from the most intimate scale to the <laughs> spectacular mobilization, actually matters, um, is, is, is extremely important. And for that, again, I am really pro-alliances between organizations of different scales and uh, also professionals in very different uh, professional positions. Because, uh, and, and, and very often, and I mean, I'm part now of a few activist groups also in Berlin, um, and, and what we decided to do very often, I mean, actually, totally, is anonymity. Like, the fact that in a group you have people in, let's say, professional positions that can allow them to do certain things that very younger generations cannot, because they are much more precarious than you. So it's also very important to understand that we play in, let's say, we occupy very, very different power positions, and that I think also as, you know, a generation that is getting older, is more established, etc. we have the responsibility also for the future to come. So it's first, uh, I remember that when I was a professional coming up that very often I was asked to do things for free because big curators in museums, for example, were maybe uh, writing a text for free or curating a show in a gallery for free. Why? Because they had a salary already and they're like, oh, come on, you don't need to pay me. And then you have somebody setting the reference. It's like, if that guy doesn't ask for a fee, why should you be asking for a fee, right? And every time we also say, hey, I'm sorry, I can't work for nothing, very often people are like, okay, you know, whatever, I'm going to ask someone else. Things that uh, have a completely different an impact when you're just starting because you feel you're one of the many and that you know start being different once you ha have let's say more of a whatever uh, professional value let's put it that way so Something that we've really been trying to um, to push forward is transnational forms of alliances between uh, institutions of different scale and really trying to hold accountable also large institutions and museums for the scenes um, that are independent. Like I think really they do need to take responsibility over this and um, we need to keep pushing for that. Um, um, and, and hence, really think about how can we go beyond simply safeguarding ourselves <laughs> and our situations and our position, but think about it in larger terms. Um, of course, the making of parameters to determine working conditions um, and, and stick to them, like I guess also you guys have been doing and we've been in conversation for a while with wage. And it's, of course, a very, very difficult uh, ground in a way because every country will have different economic conditions, etc. But we need to set some parameters. Um, this vagueness and absence of references is also what makes it possible to operate so randomly um, and really based on every individual's capacity of negotiating, basically. I mean, very often you have shows where artists are paid completely different fees because some ask for more and some for less or some don't. In Italy, recently at the Museum of Contemporary Art, somebody told me that the way they operate is that they don't pay a fee unless the artist asks for it. It's, um, yeah, but I mean, again, we have a responsibility, particularly as curators, whether in museums or not, and like we need to, um, and um, of course, encouraging spaces of advocacy and support, but I would say even support existing ones. Like, I'm very happy that you guys are here. Like, I feel also, and maybe that's what I meant yesterday, like, instead of constantly going for exceptionality and founding, find, founding new platforms, let's just support the ones that are there and make them stronger. Also by perhaps occupying positions that are more in the shadow. Who cares? We can't keep on making three million platforms. It's just not gonna bring very far. I would love to think also of social funds for emergency cases. Um, uh, something else, I mean, you know, uh, what happened 
and maybe this will come out in a conversation later, but we resigned, also uh, Ileana and I were curators for three years at Extra City Kunsthal and got into a very complete, complicated, almost, almost legal case. And what we realized is that also there, the power of negotiation is, is based on who is able to pay for justice. You know, after a while, we just couldn't afford a lawyer anymore. It was just too expensive, and then you give up, you know? And so I think also as whatever more vulnerable segments of the art world, how can we think about social funds that, you know, maybe <laughs> enable us to not end up in this? Because it's not just about uh, law, it's about having, uh, being able to afford justice. Uh, writing and denouncing, of course, I think we need to speak out loud and uh, maybe even writing anonymously, I don't know, some should sign, some not, but we need to write these things, like talk about elephants in the room, like enough omerta, we say in Italian, which is like how the mafia kind of keeps driving, which is that you just don't talk about things. Um, of course, recognizing, uh, this maybe Liana is going to say, um, yeah, and bring new forms of ethics and spaces of power, of course. Like, I would, I'm, I'm also not for just, you know, taking complete distance, but knowing that it's really important to also, um, yeah, I'm too late. I think there is a last message from Ileana, and then we're done. <laughs> and just to continue a little bit on, uh, on the aims and the purposes and the hopes and uh, the visions of, of future climates, of course, um, it was very much, let's say, an instinctive reaction to the uh, global labor conditions of the art world and this acute kind of turbo capitalist uh, conditions under which we were living that, of course, used the art world very much as, a, as the perfect guinea pig to create these zero hour contracts, this freelancing, a lot of um, volunteer work or non-paid work or non-paid enough work. But then, um, as I said previously, I think one of the aims also was, or the initial aim, even before we started the program, was to try to combine um, through uh, a more visceral experience for, for, for the people that actually came to see um, the program that we were doing um, what we were trying to say, therefore, through an exhibitional format. So we had an exhibition, actually, um, during the three-month period that Future Climates, uh, the first chapter, was running in Athens. Also, to somehow begin uh, very, very timidly, let's say, and you know, with uh, with a lot of caution, to to contour a possible toolbox that we could use. Um, in order to create a formula, if you, if you, if you will, that would be able to be applied uh, in, uh, in these conditions. <clears throat> and then, of course, possibly, let's say, the hope uh, or the vision was to ignite um, a, a dialogue um, in this field of how do we actually reflect um, on these conditions and what are your our own uh, implications um, uh, into them uh, and how we somehow perpetuate them by not reacting. Um, I'm not even sure that this was possible, but then I have to say that after the first chapter of Future Climates that of course you know, uh, because of Documenta and because of the massive amount of visitors that were in the city, in any case, had a lot of visibility. We had a few EFLUX conversations. We actually really employed, or let's say abused, the fact that Documenta was in Athens to get people to give lectures that were already in the city or were coming to the city for that, because of course there was no budget to actually support them uh, to come ourselves. Um, <clears throat> so um, I think that because of a proposition that was uh, proposed back then in uh, 2017, we have seen some new initiatives um, being unearthed and being and surfacing in several uh, places in, in the European terrain. I'm, I'm I'm not going to say for outside of Europe because I I'm also extremely aware of the fact that uh, you know Documenta might not mean anything to someone that lives in China or in India or in another part of the world, mainly because uh, it's very much 
kind of a European institution or a European symbolism of uh, you know the absolute or the utmost of um, of uh, an, an accomplishment in terms of curatorial or artistic skills. Um, so I think that would sum up somehow the uh, initial aims and purposes and desires and hopes for the project. But of course, we were very pragmatic in the sense that we uh, employed someone to actually run the project, the program coordinator, who was Avita Tokanta. And then um, we ourselves, being very precarious and being in such flex work conditions, we didn't have enough time to be physically present there. Of course, also life itself interfered as well. I remember uh, my partner had to have an operation, therefore I wasn't there for a week when I should have been and all these things. And uh, we didn't have the time uh, to actually be there and be as focused as we would have wished. I think that, of course, uh, in retrospect, was extremely important for us to realize how really embodied this experience of precarity is and how much it affects uh, things that one wants to do. Um, and also, I think it was very clear from the researchers themselves one um, realization that maybe I had somehow, by working in Athens already um, um, 12 years, uh, and maybe Antonia kind of grasped. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm also smoking whilst talking to you, but that's okay, I guess. Um, so that was, I think, the fact that we realized that a lot of these DIY structures, by going there, visiting them, give them giving lectures to us of what they want to do, or having studio visits with artists, etc. We the, the researchers and us, of course, with getting the feedback from them, we realized very qu quickly that a lot of times these structures occur because there is a seeming need for these, um, let's say, collective presentations or claims of, of, uh, of um, a, a chunk of the platform that is th this art ecology in every city, but also without having an intellectual structure that supports what it is exactly that they want to do. And this was another thing that I personally think is very much linked um, to economics and the fact that we were in a periphery where uh, discourse is in runs and develops and um, rhizomatically kind of grows in very different time frames and with very different speeds than what happens in uh, the centers. And of course that also is linked to, not, to language and the fact that when you have uh, not the lingua franca, which is English in, in terms of, of the art world, and the texts are not translated and um, you know, a lot of discourse is not produced in, in English, or if it does, uh, it's, um, you know, it's very minimal or it's very regional, then um, this means that the way that you theoretically contour and propose what it is that you want to do through this action of instituting is very, very different. Uh, and many times it's not, let's say, professionalized enough. And I'm using this word on purpose because I actually think that this is another question that we should be asking how uh, the global art system, in fact, is so much put through the, you know, the machine of marketing that we have one way of working that is very much, of course, Eurocentric or, let's say, white Western-centric. Um, and very much business-like. And possibly one of the things that through Future Climates was the, the hopeful, um, let's say, outcome was that we realized that all these DIY economies or these non-professional or non-epistemic knowledges were extremely valuable because they created um, a support system, a structure, a web, if you will, uh, of connections between people uh, that many times, you know, would borrow projectors from someone or would um, offer their translating skills for, you know, a tutorial or what have you. And this is possibly something, I'm, I, I'm speaking for myself, I hope that uh, Antonia shares that, that this would be something that future climates would be interested for in the future as well, of maybe contouring these non-epistemic knowledges and these non-epistemic and non- um, 
capitalist ways of operating that can really be extremely valuable and really you know wonderful sources of, of knowledge and i think that is that, that is quite interesting for us Thank you so much. It was very inspirational. I wrote uh, many different questions. Please. It was really longer than planned. It's not no, no, super no, easy okay. to coordinate with the voice. And uh, so. <laughs> it was very successful, I must say. I enjoyed it. And uh, yes, it's uh, great to hear more about Athens, that it's uh, really rare. Actually, we have in the uh, audience one. Uh, uh, artist from Athens, maybe later she can uh, talk a bit more about uh, the situation and how she finds it. So now I invite uh, Vladan and Corina to continue and uh, because we have to jump a bit, so to have this perfect jump <laughs> uh, to, uh, is it everything done? Uh, yeah. yeah? Is our, okay. our, can you play our PowerPoint, the next one? Yes, thank okay. you. So I, I'll actually stand for a bit because I've been sitting for too long. Um, so who here has heard about Art Leaks before? Raise your hand. Okay, so half of the audience, okay. So I won't spend so much time on the history of this project, but uh, I'll just mention that uh, our platform came together in 2010. It was born out of a very specific case around the Biennale in Bucharest. Um, a lot of um, artists and curators and writers um, had dealt with this um, pavilion uh, institution and they were not paying artists uh, and then when artists were trying to raise questions about this. Uh, they were being blacklisted and censored. Um, and a lot of us had, you know, in this group of like 10 people we were originally, have had these experiences and we're all like very angry, like how are these guys allowed to continue? And it's because like everybody was talking about it behind the scenes, you know, but nobody was actually putting it out there publicly in an open letter. So other curators who were invited continued to collaborate with them and other artists and so on and so on and so it was perpetuating the system so and then when we came together we we're like okay it makes sense not to make a case only against this one institution but these are kind of conditions of precarity and of censorship and of quotation that happen all around the world in fact and so we decided to open this to claim this space online art leaks this is very much indebted to wikileaks to occupy so we wanted to occupy this space uh, virtually space and also to open it up to um, everybody who was dealing with uh, similar conditions and we were kind of forming this kind of journalism platform and we were also taking a lot of suggestions of how it should be run there was a lot of interest originally and out of the ten members I would say like half of them are still very active within art leaks and we also remain an open platform that is uh, anybody can join us as long as you are willing to be be you know an activist in this platform it still remains open and we also wanted to not make it into an NGO and this was also a conscious decision because we, we didn't want to depend on one B funding body or another we also wanted to operate like you know in a space that is kind of in between laws and legality and national contexts so this this platform has remained you know in this way for this specific reason and it can move on um, so this is just some of the leaks and uh, some of the reporting that has happened on art leaks. We keep an archive of all of these cases and they really are international. A lot of them come from the US and from Europe, but we have expanded over the years. Um, and also what is important to say is that we don't just publish, you know, like gossip of what people or if somebody has some kind of like problem, this kind of like level of, um, you know, like hearsay, but we usually do kind of an investigative journalism into these cases and we also ask for reactions from the part of the institution or sometimes from the part of the states and in some cases these have been successfully resolved and in others like they remain open cases and we try to follow up constantly um, and to update the case as it happens. And we think this is very kind of a political gesture to draw from this anonymity 
this uh, talking behind the scenes uh, and out into the open because we you know our original impulse was that if uh, we don't begin talking about this openly and uh, articulating these problems that they will continue to occur uh, and as long as we stay silent um, things will continue to be you know as bad as they are so that's one of our motto is it's time to break the silence um, and it's still true to this day I think um, and can move on and maybe Vladan you can say something about our public activities also yeah, in, uh, in institutions and thank public you very sphere. much uh, um, I would like also to add um, one important fact like because art League started uh, almost 10 years ago and back then um, it was completely different environment if uh, if you are, if you are talking about social media or if you are talking about uh, portals where you can, for example, read about those things, like hyperallergic uh, started very, mu very much to be active in the mid of mm -hmm. 2000s around those issues. But when Art League started with this, we were like a pioneers of these uh, activities. And um, we were also connected from the beginning with uh, groups such as uh, Precarious Workers Brigade, Brigade um, and also some other um, groups which emerged. Occupy. Uh, Occupy, yes, Occupy movement uh, also in the States that emerged uh, from after the crisis in 2009. So uh, in that sense, uh, Art Leaks and Wage and all these groups that came after uh, inspired uh, other people and other journalists also to produce. For us, it was very important to produce this culture of breaking the silence. Mm -hmm. And I think that Art Leaks was, uh, in that respect, uh, doing very, very much this like important job from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, to come to these public activities, um, we, uh, we have realized that it's not only enough to uh, just to report online and to spread the, the word, uh, and in that way to push uh, for, the, for change and to, to, to give the support to the people that are reporting the cases of labor inf infringement and also censorship and uh, other issues. Uh, we decided actually to mm, to also produce different formats and uh, like also exhibitions uh, and discussions uh, and also like going to the book fairs and producing newspapers producing whole newspapers with cases so we have uh, produced um, like uh, we have also wrapped uh, s several important uh, uh, cases that we followed on the longitudinal run and uh, we have uh, we have exposed them um, more, more and more uh, times, uh, and uh, also like very much uh, aspects connected to the racism and anti-gypsyism, for example, in in Europe, uh, which is going on against uh, Romani gypsy artists and things like that. So it was not only about labor rights, but it was very much about uh, anti-racism and also like uh, against censorship. Yeah, and I just say, like, we, you know, we don't necessarily consider ourselves an art collective, although we've worked with art institutions also, but this is not the main purpose. And for us, it made sense to participate in a project or another when we could take over a space or transform it somehow. And we've done this successfully a few times. And um, also like the newspaper, so they, they're all like serving this purpose of kind of um, occupying also like a physical space and also traveling and going to contexts where we physically cannot go ourselves. And next slide. And maybe you want to talk about now this uh, Trondheim seminar, which we did a few years ago and to share the brochure. Uh, we did a Trondheim seminar uh, in, um, in, um, in Norway and we invited a lot of people who are dealing with this issue since many years, like for example, Wage, uh, Occupy Museum people, um, also like um, Greg Scholett was there, Kuba Schreder, uh, Noah Fischer, and uh, also people from the Balkans uh, who are dealing with this issue and from Scandinavian context. And uh, so for us it was very important to basically to also tackle the um, essence of the problem and this is actually the definition of uh, what labor is from the art context. So we understood immediately that there is a contradiction between uh, artistic work and work, you know, that people define uh, artistic work as something else. And uh, we came uh, to, the, to the discussion of this contradiction between art and labor. 
And then uh, the second contradiction that we discussed was the contradiction of uh, how, to, how to approach the institutions and how to build co alliances with, with the unions or with the institutions. So we tried, we tried to develop a kind of recommendation, a kind of strategy. What, is the, what are the, you know, like the common, let's say, uh, the common um, recommendation for uh, working with the institutions uh, from the position of being uh, independent or freelance artist or working with uh, trade unions uh, uh, or traditional trade unions and how we could uh, you know, improve uh, this condition. And the third contradiction was actually connected to the struggle, you know, because um, a lot of artists, um, you know, like uh, try to connect with uh, certain political movements, and sometimes this connection of artists with political movements is not fruitful. Sometimes it is damaging the political movement. Sometimes it is fruitful, sometimes it is contributing to the goal of the political movement. So, and we wanted also to discuss what are the common grounds and what are the common, so to say, uh, uh, possibilities for connecting perfectly with and having the best synergy with the uh, political movements which are functioning or activist movements which are, which are functioning in the, in, the, in the interest of both, uh, let's say, groups. So I will share with you this uh, brochure just uh, to give you here in the audience. Uh, it's online, you can download it, and at the end are the brief conclusion from the seminar. Yeah, and we also have a, f a w website with the seminar that was created and um, all the participants in the seminar also submitted their um, examples from their own context, uh, texts, practical examples, and so on. And then uh, Vladan made this really cool drawing <laughs> with the conclusions of the seminar, which I think it's probably better than a report <laughs> uh, of um, what happened there. Um, next slide. Um, and this also come, leads us to kind of our other major um, initiative, and uh, this is the Art Leaks Gazette, and I'll also ask Vladan to sh uh, share this with the uh, people in the audience. Um, we've started doing this in 2012, um, and we thought like, uh, okay, we're now breaking the silence, like this has been happening uh, for a couple of years, people are submitting stories, things are beginning to change, there's more conversation about this, but we also felt like uh, we needed this kind of um, tool to reflect about, you know, what was happening uh, yearly and uh, to have this more kind of theoretical uh, engagement, but also bring theory together with practice. So our gazettes are always like, you know, practical examples, they're kind of like artistic strategies, and then there's also, um, as I said, yeah, diff different theories like about art and labor, about anti-racism movements, about feminism and so on and each one has uh, had like a different theme uh, depending on also the interest of the editors and we also try to make this as an, an open um, kind of process and uh, so usually it's Vlada and I are two of the editors and then we invite uh, one or two other people from the outside to join the editorial team for uh, a certain issue so also if there's here any people interested <laughs> that uh, we, we you know we welcome you to 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 join us um, and go to the next slide. Oh, this one doesn't have an image. Anyway, go to the next one. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, so these are just some of the gazettes that are now circulating uh, in the audience. Um, and uh, as I said, they, they, they dealt with, you know, what happened after you break the silence, uh, how do you organize, uh, whose art worlds, um, what does, you know, justice mean, uh, what is, you know, our vision, vision you know, for a different art world. Uh, the latest one, um, which we can also share, uh, uh, is this one that uh, was dealing more specifically with this queer anti-racist perspectives in the art world and uh, in social movements today that we felt like made a considerable impact and uh, the, also the impact of the Me Too movement uh, around the world. Go on to the next one. 
Um, yeah, and all of these we've also um, put online and they're free to download. Um, and uh, over the years we have had many different collaborators um, and they've also brought in new people um, to uh, reflect on these issues. Um, and for each of these gazettes, like because we are not a publishing house, uh, we ju do a very small print run, usually for events such as these. And we rely mo mostly on online distribution, which is uh, for free and go on to the next one. So this is the latest issue that Vladan you can uh, share now. Uh, so it's um, inspired actually by a song by um, a performer, performer called Planning to Rock and it's called Patriarchy Over and Out. We kind of fell in love with this title and then Discourse Made Manifest. Um, and uh, for this we worked with uh, Yasmina Tumbas who I think a lot of you know uh, also from um, uh, Serbia and also from uh, Germany who lives now in the United States and she brought in a lot of these um, um, artists and uh, activists uh, dealing with this kind of different political struggles around um, feminist and queer issues and anti-racism. Um, go ahead. Okay, so these are just some of the um, essays. Uh, so there's some that are more kind of coming from this, um, you know, um, musical, artistic, more lyrical perspective. Like we felt the, this issue needed kind of like an anthem song for it. And th this was the song, Patriarchy Over and Out. Move on to the next one. Uh, and then we included other ly lyrics uh, by the same uh, artist. Next slide. Uh, then we had uh, things that are direct, uh, reflecting on direct actions and the group decolonializes place that I spoke about um, yesterday and one of the members of the group was reflecting on their recent struggle against the MoMA, uh, sorry, against the, the Whitney uh, in New York City and uh, removing the CEO of the board who was also um, running this uh, Safari Land company that was um, supplying uh, gas to use against migrants at the southern border of the US and also uh, in um, like tear gas against protesters. Um, so finally, after a really long campaign of several years, uh, they managed to um, you know, have this guy uh, resign from the board move on to the next one. Um, so, and they also did the, what you were mentioning, this uh, notion of repatriations of this, uh, you know, imperialistic uh, plunder that this is an action at the Brooklyn Museum, which is also this kind of encyclopedic museum that has all these artifacts from other cultures. Um, and they were also kind of uh, mentioning that, you know, uh, this museum like loves to show art by all of these different cultures, but also in the structure of the institution institution, they don't have uh, people coming from this uh, background. So the institution is mostly run by, um, you know, this white middle class people. Uh, and these on the left were actions um, at, the, um, at the Whitney. Again, next one. Uh, and then we also have uh, this um, case, uh, for example, uh, from Buffalo, um, in which uh, artists and students self-organized uh, to remove from the school board uh, Carl Paladino, who was this um, Trump supporter, extremely openly racist, homophobic guy, and he was running the, the school board of Buffalo. And uh, again, after several years of uh, protest, of like meeting with the officials, uh, they managed to have have him removed from the board. Next one. Um, and then we have this kind of other reflections that are again more uh, lyrical, uh, that are dealing with uh, gentrification, with the realities of living in this hyper-capitalist city like like New York City, and how you live, and you know this this struggle uh, to survive in these environments. Go on. And uh, also we have um, essays that deal with uh, gentrification um, and especially gentrification of uh, communities of color. This is an essay that uh, talks about how uh, the Chinese immigrants who were uh, living in Sunset Park that settled uh, in Brooklyn um, 
are now being uh, displaced from this area to make space for this kind of like uh, middle class uh, families. And uh, the, the artist uh, Betty Yu has been doing this kind of consciousness raising uh, workshops and awareness about the history of uh, immigrants coming to this area of town and how it's now changing and how they're being um, displaced uh, from their homes. Go ahead, yeah. This is also part of her uh, her her workshops and her her maps of Sunset Park and uh, the neighborhood and kind of like the racial makeup of it and uh, the different class uh, kind of differentials in the neighborhood. Next one, and uh, show, showing this uh, in different contexts, also in this kind of um, workshop context, but also showing them in the context of um, exhibitions and uh, installations. Go on. But yeah, and then we have also, uh, again, visual interventions like protest posters, uh, anti-war posters. Next one. Uh, and then um, this is also a publication that's presented here. Um, from Croatia. From Croatia, yeah. Uh, next one. And then we even have, uh, for this issue, um, issues of uh, being vegan and kind of like taking this political uh, position of being an intersectional uh, vegan person. And uh, we also got permission from General Idea to republish this image uh, that is very powerful, Nazi milk, um, as part of this essay. Next one. Yeah, uh, so this is kind of just like a brief overview of very different issues that we have beginning to tackle uh, in this Gazette. And as I said, right now we do a one, try to do one every year, and uh, we are also looking for editors and um, also contributors. Um, so if anybody from this uh, group is um, interested and to contribute their perspectives, we're definitely very open to uh, to having more uh, more voices uh, join us, and maybe. You want to say something now? Also. Um, maybe, mm, maybe not about the Gazette. Maybe about um, that. Uh, on our website, you can find a huge reading list <laughs> uh, with a lot of, Lots uh, of reading. <laughs> a lot of reading. Yes, a lot of texts related to the, those questions. So we and Corina, uh, Corina mostly, but also me and other people were collecting this uh, bibliography since uh, many years. So you are um, you are invited to download this and uh, to read uh, uh, some of the articles you would like to uh, to read um, um, and um, maybe to say that uh, practically um, we need to um, like we could for example consider to do some kind of uh, evaluation of our work uh, mm -hmm. because a lot of people ask us uh, did you really contribute to the you know to some case that was solved or that mm -hmm. was uh, that was like uh, that you like help the people to solve the issue and i think that uh, there are several cases that we actually really pushed it that art leaks was very important uh, support for those people and uh, that at the end uh, this was uh, practically going into direction of uh, positive, uh, positive mm -hmm. development for them. Um, and this also, is like, mm -hmm. one of the tools that some of our members did in the beginning was this uh, no fee statement that has been very popular. You can download it from our website, and it's basically whenever an institution that is publicly or pub privately funded invites you to work for them, but they don't want to pay you. There's like no fee. There's no budget. You make them. You ask them to sign this paper and say like, I so so the undersigned. You know, like declare that I invited so and so. Person and with zero honorarium, and then have them sign it and like use a stamp if there is like an institutional stamp. And then we said like we're going to collect all of these and put them on the website. And most of the times, what has happened is that when people ask uh, institutions to to sign this form, uh, nobody wants to sign it. So uh, and instead they give them an honorarium. Most most cases. So it's these kind of like interventions that have been you know sometimes very successful uh, yeah go yes, ahead. I'm, um, it is it is uh, I think it is very important that we somehow uh, from the beginning try to always have have this mix of really practical tools for like as now Corina explained but in the same time uh, we always try to think about uh, what we are doing actually what is the history behind of our work 
and what, is, what are our references to what we are doing and also to articulate what is the definition of our work, of media today, of labor and so on. Especially in the moment uh, like uh, when we see that leaking is uh, basically globally criminalized. Mm. Yeah, we see what is going on with uh, Assange today. Uh, it's like uh, he is publicly tortured. It's like reality of torturing that we are witnessing. And uh, um, it is, uh, you know, a kind of, uh, that world, world became a much worse place than uh, that, that actually like 10 years ago when we started this, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that uh, even our name, Art Leaks, uh, has some kind of um, resistance in this uh, surrounding which mm -hmm. we are finding ourselves in this mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so maybe we'll end here because I want to leave more time for discussion and we can continue. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would uh, draw, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for these uh, talks and presentations. And what I can say, and I wouldn't take a lot of time, but I would like to kind of draw some perspectives for further discussion. It's uh, somehow uh, being and working here and uh, being very also active uh, internationally and regionally. With my colleagues, I can find a lot of uh, uh, common spots or common uh, uh, ground that we can talk about. And since I know that this, um, these talks were here to be somehow uh, inspirational or as Vladen said, some tools for positive developments uh, that can be done. Uh, however, I think it can be kind of be also inspirational uh, for us here. What I can uh, find as a common ground is that uh, firstly we need to talk uh, or discuss or learn, um, discuss or decide uh, uh, what kind of culture we produce here in a sense of this culture of uh, breaking the silence or you were talking about this culture of responsibility or care or belonging. I found very important also that uh, you were saying what that means to name the things or to be really direct to confront in that sense or maybe to 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 make these problems visible so this is related to this breaking of silence so what would, could be this path that I can uh, see here, how we can organize ourselves in order to make visible our problems here in the field, what is our role as curators and artists, but also what is the role of the institutions, because somehow here I think we are in this neutralizing position, which means uh, we are in a silent culture rather than breaking the silence in sense of that uh, we have some changes in the institutions, we have some uh, transformations, but they are not on the level that we should go to and towards. But however, is this, um, because uh, you were talking about this Biennale uh, that you were and where this uh, happened. Uh, these kind of cases were happening also here, you know. But then the artists were silent, the uh, curators were silent, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe uh, someone else would like from the audience to continue or give their uh, perspective from here. What is this, why we are in this uh, position being uh, maybe neutral and uh, not really forwarding this um, uh, uh, or changing the path and a highway for struggle, further struggles. Maybe I can give, don't worry. So, <clears throat> okay, I can invite you to talk also about, uh, I have more. Um, yes, how you in your practice, you negotiate, how do you talk within the sphere in which you work, within the, uh, with the institutions, how you negotiate for your fees, for how this uh, is related to your responsibility, I would say, as you said. Uh, we have also uh, some... Um, 
some very <laughs> funny situations that also some people being in the institutions and having this position in institutions, on the contrary that you were saying before, are uh, also being part of independent scenes. So are they in the privileged position from which they're talking or are they in the alliance or accomplished position, something like that, from where they can advocate for the rights in the independent scene. We have uh, our friends working in the institutions, but also being part of uh, the independent scene. How we can use these positions in building the alliances rather than uh, being uh, those who can kind of change the possibilities for fair work, for better payment, and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> this this talk is gonna lasting a bit longer than we expected, but still, like I can maybe a bit uh, comment on the first part, or actually on the first question that you can pose, or the first comment about this breaking the silence um, uh, thing, like. Uh, I can only speak from my position, and I think that we've, din we've done jointly with Biljana and with Philip and with Violeta and Oliver a lot of stuff, you know, like to voice up our position, but also like the circumstances that we are working in or dealing with. But in a sense, like I think that we reached a moment uh, that, um, uh, like, that uh, not uh, that this precarious thing that we are so so much accentuating or stressing is being ironized in a sense, you know. Or you look at all these like kind of precarious workers, what they are wanting, or maybe like you you have the question like I sometimes like uh, um, get a question like why don't you find a proper job in an institution or something, you know? So uh, I don't know like uh, there is. Some some kind of um, some kind of field here that we are facing with the try to really neutralize and even kind of put this precariousness in a negative context, really not try to pose it in the right direction. So this is something that uh, that uh, that I'm sensing in the moment, and I'm, and also I wanted to reflect that also like. This was really nice that Antonia mentioned that we also have to keep responsible the public institutions for the circumstances that we as in the non-institutional scene are, are working with. But still, I cannot see it somehow vaguely in this moment. Like somehow the institutions really function separately and they don't want to kind of really um, uh, to see what we are facing with. Even with the collective agreement, like some of the other problems that they are kind of raising in the moment, or this syndicate, like or this union for for employed people in cultures, like they are really kind of posing all these questions that they are that they they are theirs, but they are not want, they don't want to kind of um, uh, cope or maybe deal with our problems at all. So like I cannot see this kind of sense of solidarity between between the cultural workers, you know, in that sense. So maybe somebody else can also kind of reflect on this. Um, I also would like to uh, to comment on the first topic, Bilina, that you opened, uh, and uh, I appreciate you you calling it the culture of silence, um, because I think that um, why I really appreciate, like for instance, why or how art leaks came about, was because it um, it created a pathway for people to be hurt without them being individually singled out, and I think that. Um, this uh, culture of silence is not necessarily, you know, the lack of strength uh, on the part of the artist. It is the the symptom of the of the general condition and um, uh, repression, in a way, uh, uh, of, um, of, of of a very brutal working environment. Um, because I think that, like in you know, in the small scenes uh, uh, where, uh, uh, especially like I don't know, Slovenia, Macedonia, where everyone knows each other, you know, like you do not speak out because you are uh, simply scared of your livelihood that is already so precarious that you know that if you will be seen as the problematic one, you will not even get what you might get otherwise. And this is like an infinite circle of being caught in this culture of silence, uh, and and it doesn't just go uh, about the working 
condition. I mean, like at least in Slovenia, we have not had a single case of, for instance, Me Too, even though we all know or experienced like sexual harassment on work um, in, in art, but uh, it is impossible almost to break through this. And this is, I think, in a way connected with the fact that, you know, as a freelance artist or cultural workers, we are not, of course, we do not have a, a, a formal representation in forms of the union because our statuses in most of the post yugoslav countries are actually the one of a self-employed um, business woman or man. Uh, we are at the same time our own boss and uh, our own emplo employee. Um, which, of course, uh, prevents us from unionizing in a formal way. At least this is the case in Slovenia in terms of a very legal uh, point. And, uh, of course, that also means that, um, you know, it is necessary to find other ways of being of togetherness, uh, of a community that is able to create a common platform in which we can be protected by our commonality uh, and, uh, and gives us the strength to, to kind of fight against this what Billina really beautifully said, culture of silence uh, that is imposed on us. So um, I just, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment that maybe can spark a discussion. Yeah, I just wanted to say also from, I didn't mention this in the presentation, but uh, you know, some of these cases are signed by people who want to put their names forward. And when we started Art Leaks, we felt like people need to know who is behind this platform and we cannot do it anonymous. like. We cannot be like anonymous, and uh, but also we've had cases where people have decided to use, you know, like the alias of a collective and just say like we, the art workers of this scene, say that this is wrong and so on. So we've also printed things like this that have been successful. So it's like not like we cannot, we don't go out there and it's like, oh no, you need to put your name, otherwise like you can't be published. And also we've had this case in the, it's featured in this current issue, Patriarchy Over and Out of uh, Heard and Seen, which is this collective from India. Um, and they've been doing like really great work and they have a Instagram account where they expose all of these, like mostly men, you know, who have been um, sexually, you know, being predators um, and uh, oh, like, you know, just like naming them and everything. And this has caused like, like a lot of ripples uh, in the scene there. But also, like recently, we found out that now they are being per persecuted for this, like in, in court, you know? Uh, so it's not without kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also, we share this on Art Leaks that now they are being sued, you know, because, yeah. So these things are also very complicated, but I also feel like, you know, like it's, if you say, I mean, in, in some ways, there's very little to lose, you know? Like, we are getting to this point where you have to take a stand, whether collectively, you know, in some cases anonymously, um, but you have to do it. Like, in Poland, we also published this case where the main institution for contemporary art is now, you know, under the directorship almost of this super, you know, like, right-wing, homophobic, racist guy appointed by the government, and this is kind of like, now it's kind of done already. So so it's, it's, it's getting to a point where I feel like you have to be, you know, you cannot stay silent anymore. Yeah, yeah actually, if you look uh, at all posts in the last 10 years, what we published, what Artleaks published, you can find uh, actually the history of, the art history of something else, you know, that, that you can write about. You know, it's, it's really, um, they are not so, um, in that sense, it is uh, important like, to keep tracking of these things. It's just a comment. Um, yeah, no, I wanted to pick up on something you said that I think is really important from the local and international perspective, which is something that also Victoria Ivanova, actually, I was mentioned before, brought in, which is the reputation as a, as, a, as a value in the art context in which pushes can happen via reputation whether you're difficult or that you ruin a reputation, which is also what the Me Too campaign did by leading certain people to be, to be fired, not because of legal <laughs> cases even at that point, but because of reputation. And I think that as much as, you know, the problem of like being tailored as, or being defined as difficult, blah, 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 is the downside of it. But on the other hand, it's also something to be conscious about for pushes in the other direction, that you can, also question the reputation of certain whatever, whether individuals or institutions by, of course, I think it's really important, group voicing. Like I was reading actually this morning while preparing, um, there was a case by uh, Nikis Columbus, who's a um, 
who's a curator basically that was hired, I think as performance curator at MoMA. And then uh, when she, during the negotiation, told the MoMA that she was about to have a child, they decide to not hire her anymore. And she made a huge case out of it now, and I mean, this is really from this year. And while reading an interview to her, and actually Hyperallergic just published a very interesting piece about this type of cases, was that even though she spoke out and she felt she could do it because as a, let's say, successful curator in her 40s, she, feels, she felt, if I don't speak out, you know, what about, but that very few newspapers and art newspapers actually picked up on this story. Um, it, the New York Times at a certain point wrote a piece and that's actually when the MoMA finally reacted and actually the MoMA at the end did not hire her anyway but did reimburse her with a lot of money out of a, to close a court case and again nobody wrote about it and this is a problem because in order to set references it's really not just about internal and I think you know, in a way that's also what uh, actually Julian Assange was saying himself about WikiLeaks like the one of the um, let's say, things that didn't make us a lot of information existing on WikiLeaks uh, have an agency is that very few journalists would actually publish about it. And the fact is that if, if it only exists on ArtLeaks and it doesn't get pushed forward by a lot of different platforms that is from social media to public conferences to articles, it will just stay as it is. And so that's where I think really so many different types of actions are fundamental in which, again, how can we create a sense of belonging for a sphere that is not just uh, my direct environment, but thinking about that any case, whether it's local or international, matters because we are part of the same ecosystem and that its echoes might have repercussions that again are from the local to the transnational. And then maybe something also uh, to respond to what you were saying also about the relationship between independence in the museum scene, which for me again is the same. Like, yes, we expect institutions to care about the independence scene, but do we care about, like, I think also there, there needs to be a mutual act of care. Do you care about museums? Like, again, how can we not just, you know, strive for rights that are really just limited by our individuality and our own working condition, but how can we be a bit broader and, like, think about mutual care? And that's, I think, where perhaps then we start being together, but not just expect which uh, you know, I often fail to do myself, you know, others to be interested in you if you don't also uh, you know, think about what, what is the right of the museum, what are those conditions which are very often also, you know, uh, whatever, precarious and vulnerable, blah, blah. I know. <laughs> Even uh, because... This mic is, this mic is <laughs> no, like uh, uh, I, I just picked one quote from Anthony. He's the director of the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, actually the first in institution in United States that incorporated wage. So they have this like kind of, and uh, he said one moment like to me like even our institutions just don't care about us, you know. And the second thing I wanted to quote is. Um, is uh, Slobodan Unkovsky actually, he's a co-founder of this space and he's a theater director, a really famous one in Macedonia and he said one moment, uh, institutions should stop existing in Macedonia because like we cannot afford it, you know, like they spend a lot of money and we're a small country and there are so many institutions. In this sense like yes, of course I understand your comment and it's like we have to work together in order to improve the situation, like of course and we, uh, we've approached uh, several times the union for cultural workers that are employed in the in the um, in the institutions that really kind of function well and have so many kind of good initiatives but in a sense like uh, first of all I, re I really cannot see how to explain the situation that we are living in because like I think that people just don't want to accept it they don't want to accept that the civil sector exists. And I think that the first thing is like, the question is like how to kind of attack, uh, how to, um, uh, to talk about the, the civil sector in a positive way, because we have, in, since the 90s, we have this like kind of negative uh, connotation, like the civil sector is understood in negative terms. And we, when we, I think that we first have tackled that question, and then in order to maybe to to uh, talk about the labor rights of freelance cultural workers, etc. But I don't know. Like I still want to hear so for somebody else the opinion. Maybe I'm just like being too negative in this moment. <laughs>
because I agree with you, maybe I can just <laughs> kind of relate to that. It was uh, even uh, once um, in, uh, I think it was uh, our presentation and discussion uh, about the labor rights when we started working. It was um, one colleague that is working at the university said, uh, but only institution can legitimize everything what you do. So therefore, everything what you do in the civil sector, it's not uh, existing or it's not important. So there are several actions that we have to do in order to, um, I don't know, claim back our <laughs> positive reputation in some way, but we have to have alliances with the people, as I said, institutions. Because, uh, for example, we, we were also attacked brutally by some people when we were from the institutions and those working directly with the, uh, with the uh, I don't know, policies and etc. Uh, by being those that we claim for money. This is why we are really important, importantly uh, voicing ourselves. And uh, it's not understood that it's, uh, we don't claim for uh, uh, funds uh, for ourselves individually, but we are voicing out uh, uh, those who were or who are maybe silent in this position or those who can how to say, not even voicing, you know, speaking about the probl problems that exist, even for a small, uh, a small amount of people. So I think this erosionization of precarity, also this uh, kind of like very, very comfortable position within institutions because you have uh, uh, life contracts, you know, from where you are uh, claiming something or asking something or, I don't know, di directing something toward it's kind of neglecting the existence of someone and something where, as you said, the brain is, uh, is being born or something like that. So uh, this is very important to understand here because um, uh, being individually single out, as you said, uh, being working in this uh, kind of brutal environment needs probably to rethink what are these uh, mechanisms, how we can act. First of all, you cannot maybe become alliance with someone that negatively uh, uh, works on uh, your reputation, but you have to maybe break the silence and say, claim it out, you know, that, uh, that this is not the situation. In that sense, I was thinking it's very important to realize that it's uh, this very fragile environment in which we are working out, where the institutions do not ask themselves why they exist, what's their politicality, what is the politics that they are facing, or how they, how they act in that realm or something, and what is their responsibility at the end, and to what kind of reputation they, they kind of, um, yeah, uh, f they, uh, what kind of reputation they produce of themselves, but also in relation to the civil society. Just one comment, and thank you for so inspiring, and I think we have so much topics for the next five days. <laughs> but just one comment on the, this relation with the institutions. For one concrete example, one of the best institutions which we collaborate, like Youth Cultural Center, Mokotse, in the past two years after the changing of the government, they still have this, how, VEDA director, how it's called, like a... Uh, uh, interim? Interim. No, the director that it's not appointed, but... Yes. Uh, interim director. Interim. 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 Oh, this is called. And the party tried to put another director who is not from the scene, he's even not... Hmm. Uh, he's like musician, pop singer. And huge <laughs> struggle and support was, especially from the independent scene. And here I see one problem that I think we should, we should address in the future, that is that we, we created culture on, on reaction not culture of strategic making alliances. Mm -hmm. So nobody's mm -hmm. speaking that we are precarious and losing our time writing manifestos, reactions, negotiating with the, with the mayor of Skopje and et cetera. Mm -hmm. But we are just talking about uh, that this, this director should stay there, which is great director, great institution, they really work, really good stuff and we really co collaborate. So I think we should change direction to more strategic uh, 
creating uh, political connections with institutions, not reactions. Because what happened with the time of Gruevsky and the experience of the whole this activistic and cultural thing was we created culture of reaction and now we are in, we are in the same process of period of post-traumatic period of we don't know what to do with this reaction because we are all the time reacting, now we don't have the monster. Mm. So what we are going to do now? So mm -hmm. this issue, I think, is very important. So, yeah. so from this position, we should maybe challenge the institutions. So what are our... So that's Thank you so much. Uh, uh, it is, uh, Uh, thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Karla from Croatia. I just wanted to make a brief comment on this um, collaboration between institution and independent scene. Uh, before three, or three and a half years, I started a little initiative in the south of Croatia, which was revitalizing cinema spaces in the villages. And uh, I started collaborating with different museums and galleries uh, in the Dubrovnik area and it was very useful for our initiative uh, because uh, we used their infrastructure, their projectors, and I think uh, they used uh, our knowledge, uh, other capital of knowledge we have uh, from independent scene. So I think these kind of collaborations are very important, especially for decentralization of culture because I think um, I think, in my opinion, uh, very important things are happening in, in independent scene in Croatia. It's not like atmosphere that uh, important things are happening in institutions. So, uh, also, I think uh, in independent scene there is um, uh, like some power institutions. Uh, the organizations that are stable from the 19th uh, and have very uh, stable uh, way of financing themselves. So we have to, I don't know, um, have different lines, you know, uh, some uh, uh, younger initiatives don't have that kind of stable uh, financing. So I think it's very important to collaborate with everybody, especially when we have demands uh, to the ministry uh, about increasing the budgets and yeah thanks uh, hello i'm from greece i'm a, part, a funding member of a cultural uh, group it's a non-profit organization it's called twixlab and uh, i wanted to say that uh, we were founded in 2013 14 let's say we started having our own space and till today we're not viable and uh, we do things, the things because we really want to do them, but uh, it, uh, this thing doesn't really, it doesn't work uh, on a, yeah. It's, a, it's not a viable thing. Uh, so uh, the, the situation in, in Greece is, uh, I would say, even worse than in Macedonia in terms of uh, cultural workers and artists. Uh, we don't have any funding from the ministry, for example. There is no uh, insurance. And uh, so, there is, uh, th for me, the, the most important problem like, right now that is that there is no legal framework uh, for culture organizations or for artists. Uh, so, it's, it's very difficult to uh, find a strategy on how to work. So, basically, the accountant, our accountant, has been uh, forming part of our program in a way uh, by his own advice on how to manage things on how to, uh, for example, uh, deal with economic aspects, the legal aspects of the organization and everything. So I think that uh, the most important thing is to have a discussion on uh, how we could change legal frameworks, for example, in order to be able to continue to do what we do, but on the right way, like uh, to have some legal framework that uh, <clears throat> addresses the exact practice of being an artist or being an art institution. So I was. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, if there is uh, some <clears throat> if there is some changes in the legal frame here in Macedonia. If uh, I don't know how how things are now from a legal point of view. I will. Uh, um, um, I, I want. Sorry, I want to. I will not answer your question about the legal framework in Macedonia because. Uh, we discussed this uh, bit, a bit uh, yesterday, but maybe Violetta or even I can't say, or 
Biljana. I would like just to um, refer to this issue of institutions uh, and like uh, position of function of in the institutions. I think that um, it is actually um, very important to uh, analyze and to understand the context and function of the institutions in, the, in different countries. Um, we have here, for example, Ser like Serbia, Macedonia, Croatia, as an example. In Croatia, Croatia is uh, already very de de decentralized due to tourism. Well, if in, in comparison to Macedonia and Serbia. So in Serbia and Macedonia, you have a kind of monopoly, institutional monopoly of the nation state institutions and uh, you have like only one museum of contemporary art. Uh, just recently, Charles Esche was in Belgrade, a curator from Van Abe Museum from Holland, and we discussed about in environment in Serbia, and conclusion was, well, the problem here is that there are no institutions, real institutions. In that sense, you have only one museum of contemporary art, because if you are, as an artist working in Holland or in Germany, if you cannot collaborate with one museum, you can collaborate with another, or with uh, some Kunsthalle, not in Hamburg, but maybe in Düsseldorf, or you will go to Utrecht, to Maria Hlavajova, if you, want to, if you don't want to collaborate with Charles Esch. <laughs> uh, you know, it is, um, it is um, um, uh, in, in this post-communist uh, kind of uh, countries, tran transitional, uh, and call it whatever, I mean, I am very critical toward this, uh, uh, notion of transition and category, how it was used. Um, there is, uh, like, um, we need to really to, um, let's say, um, to think how to approach it. Because there is a certain uh, truth in, in this statement which sounds nation state 60s that only institutional art is valid. But this statement, it is valid for countries like Serbia or maybe Macedonia, unfortunately. But in the same time, in the international context, you have so much of private capital and private art institutions, institutions that you even don't know, which are functioning under um, extreme financialized conditions and uh, they are private, and they are art dealers, collectioners, a lot of people that you even don't heard about them, and who are very powerful, and who don't care about nation states, institutions. So, this is um, varieties in we are uh, finding ourselves now. And this variety is, uh, ve um, I also don't have an answer to this, how to approach it, what to do, how to build. I think actually that the best way, what we already mentioned, is like to, um, to find the workers from the institutions which, which you can work with. You don't need to work with the institution, but you work with the workers from the institution in that sense on different levels. So this is my, uh, how I see this um, um, practice, you know. Do you want to comment, Beliana, or can I say yes. shortly? <laughs> well, I'm from the evil institution. Uh, I, I feel a slight urge I need to say something. I am from Ljubljana, from Moderna Galleria. And I have to say there are institutions, institutions, institutions with capital I, with small I, you call it whatever you want. But institutions are not just some kind of term. As you said, there are people working in these institutions, a variety of different jobs that are happening in institutions. You have these cognitive jobs, you have the jobs that are very physical. So it's all these sorts of people that are there. There's just not some evil entities waiting to extract works and exploit artists, of course. <laughs> um, but this deliberation on the variety of uh, relations between institutions, social movements, NGOs, artists have been going on for quite some time. 
Um, I would say the most strong uh, theoretical and practical background is probably in Latin America and also in Spain. And in Spain, if you have a chance, uh, maybe you are familiar with it, they came up with this term, uh, monster institutions that I mentioned today already, when they're precisely thinking what would be this kind of new institution that would be created jointly. So institution, people from the institution, and uh, movements, people from outside, let's say, constituencies, what it's called now. So there are institutions around Europe too that are part of this deliberation. One is the confederation called Internazionale. Maybe somebody heard about this confederation, but there are some museums from Spain, from Holland, from Belgium, uh, Moderna Galleria, uh, places in Turkey. So I want to point out there are different kinds of institutions, not just these uh, entities that are like this or exploiting and so on. So, you know, I am from one of such institutions and we are constantly rethinking what is our position, what are our political views, how do we uh, open and how do we uh, work with the constituencies. So there is, you know, there's other ways of seeing <clears throat> the art scene. Thank you, Buena. I think that always, whatever we start, we end up with the term of institutions. Uh, that probably it's this um, topic, it's um, very urgent, not as a notion, but also the way how uh, they work and how we think of them or how we imagine them. Uh, it's important after this, I go with Philip in Gießen on one seminar, Imagining Institution with Buena Kunst. There is also some other, you know, even in performing arts, examples of opening up uh, uh, programs towards the communities. So it's like these open formats, they're curators that are curating open formats, which are not giving the possibility only to the civil society to co-curate with them, but they also give their wages with them. So there are different mechanisms of solidarity and making these relations uh, within uh, the, let's say, scene. I wouldn't uh, differentiate institutional and non-institutional, but this is like this uh, larger scene. Um, but uh, I think that uh, the problem here, how we talk, it's because there is this partization, I would say, or really kind of politically directly directed uh, institutions. So I would um, deliberately use the word autonomy or <laughs> how, how they can have their autonomy. Maybe this is also something that we can help to the institutions, how they can reach their autonomy and being more, you know, uh, and use this overused the word independent, but being more detached maybe from these political powers that are all the time uh, directing uh, their, I don't know, directing not only programmatic ways of working, but also how they deal with the infrastructure. But when I say infrastructure, I think not on these uh, walls, but infrastructure in sense of uh, people, as you said, of a different kind working, as well as value, because this material infrastructure is not prior. The prior is the people and the workers inside. So how their work is valued or how their labor is valued in that sense. Because also in the institutions here we have some workers, cultural workers that are underpaid. They're paid like with 250 euros, which is, uh, wow, you cannot live with this wage, you know. They're, un they're not employed, as Vladan said, and etc. Maybe we should start thinking also how to combine these problems or how to find the common ground, like common denominator in a sense of uh, problems that we are facing rather than always, um, as you said, uh, seeing them as... Uh, some kind of alienated structures. There are also the invisibles, invisibles yeah. in the institutions like cleaning personnel that are uh, hired by some agencies and so, you know. Um, yeah, no, no, I mean, I agree 
of course, generally, we're generalizing a lot, and there's differences of all sorts in the independent scene, institutional scene, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe on that end, like to respond to something that Philip said that I think is really beautiful about how do you, the, the sort of post-reaction moment. I feel there's also perhaps, and we were having these conversations in Germany where the new buzzword is diversity and diversifying museums, blah, blah, and like how do you move, how do you start a new vocabulary? So when you say about struggles about workers' rights or salaries or, you know, collaborations about uh, whatever, artist fees or a mo more just relations between... It's not... It's almost like everybody is concerned with, like, a loss of privilege instead of thinking about it as an enrichment for everyone in the scene. Like, paying a proper fee or a salary is not losing parts of your budget that would otherwise go into production, but it's probably aiming at creating a better living condition that might also lead to actually make better artworks, have better professionals, because if you don't need 300 jobs, but three instead, you can actually dedicate more research and focus. Like, think about an, an even a strategic long-term enrichment for everyone, instead of constantly, like, it's like this fight, like, I want more from your cake, you want more from, from mine, and same with this kind of, like, relations between organizations, it's not about just, uh, you know, taking something away from somebody who's bad, but actually there is, everybody is getting enriched out of that collaboration, and um, yeah. I think we are like, we have to wrap up, yes? Um, so maybe we can continue thinking in the next session, especially because uh, there are a lot of suggestions and very uh, inspiring proposals <laughs> to balance. But uh, so maybe I can end up with the question that we need to really think, maybe also not only how to organize ourselves in a very different and specific contexts that we are coming from, but maybe how to reorganize or organize ourselves transnationally, this uh, semi-periphery economics semi-peripheries from where we are coming that are reshaping uh, the labor rights, uh, uh, that where the labor rights are reshaped through the conditions of politics of economy mostly. So uh, let's think fruitfully forward in the next sessions and thank you very much for the inspirational <laughs> presentations, but also thank you very much for the contributions and the discussion. Uh, the next session is at 4. See you at 4.